Hey, I'm so glad that you joined us. Um, we were oh, yeah. just talking about some news, but we can halt all that and um, and pick up with you. I, I'm excited to talk to you. Um, Shannon Thanks. had provided me some context, and I've seen some of um, your stories as far as your experience. And for me, um, NDEs have always fascinated me. Uh, fascinate is not even a correct term, but... <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. Well, and and I'm on the other side of the fence. I, I never really believed in NDEs. I grew up believing that there was no life after death, that when we died, we went to the grave until Christ returns. And the NDEs were a product of chemical breakdown when people were dying. So only recently, after uh, you know spending a lot of time with, with Christopher, have I started to reconsider my position in that regard. So I'm excited to talk awesome. to you tonight. Let's talk about all of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, John, do you have just a second to let our viewers know a little background about you? I li I'd rather you yeah. say it than than me, just because it, it's. I'd rather you say it, just because it comes out better. <laughs> yeah, you mean just you know how how I got into all this and yeah, however you want to however you want to uh, let the viewers know who you are. Um, I know, but it's it's better in your own words. Yeah. So. Um, so I, I wrote a book called Imagine Heaven in 2015, um, and the subtitle is Near-Death Experiences, God's Promises, and the Exhilarating Future That Awaits You. Um, and just recently wrote a book, Imagine the God of Heaven, which is really similar but focused in really on the character and the person of God. But the, the whole way I got there was really my whole life story. Um, I was an agnostic. I, I didn't believe, I, I didn't know what I believed about God, probably wasn't, there wasn't one, Jesus was a legend, nobody could answer any, any of my questions, and um, I studied engineering, so that's the way my mind works, like, okay, how does this work, how do you know, show me, <laughs> you know, I, I need some, I need some facts, I need some evidence, and, um, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up with my parents taking me to church just long enough for me to drive them crazy with all my questions and nobody, nobody would answer them. So I was like, I'm out. And, um, so then my dad was dying of cancer and someone gave him the very first research on near death experiences, the book that coined the term. And I saw it on his bedside table. I pick it up. I just start thumbing through it and I, I couldn't put it down. I read the whole thing in one night. And because so many of the people were talking about, um, the reality of this life after their heart stopped beating, you know, no brain waves even. And yet this experience of a life that was, they say, more real than this life. And many in the presence of this God of light and love, some were in the presence of Jesus. Some knew the, they were the same. And I, I read the whole thing. I was like, whoa, okay, maybe this is actual some this is actually some kind of tangible evidence that that this stuff is real maybe and i wasn't convinced um but i was open and i hadn't been open before that uh so so i uh i started reading the bible after that and and not that long after i i came to faith in christ because i started to understand uh grace and how the how the pieces kind of fit together um but I always had this curiosity, like, what are these near-death experiences and how do they fit with what God revealed in the scriptures? And, and so over the last 35 years, I've, I've studied well over a thousand, probably 1,500 or so of them now, interviewed many, many uh, hundreds of people uh, personally. And um, yeah, and that's what led to writing Imagine Heaven, where I was trying to really show that across thousands of experiences, there are commonalities of, of yes. what they say. And they, and yes. they say this all around the world. Every time. Yep. Yeah. And, Every and, time. And I traced about 40 commonalities. And what's hmm. amazing is I also did a study of, you know, how, and Imagine Heaven is really showing how those commonalities are, are exactly what we would expect from the scriptures already. It's what God's been revealing all along of what to expect in the afterlife. 
And, and so I was just showing, you know, not just what the Bible says, but through these people's eyes, I have about 120 of their stories in there. Wow. So I'm showing the scriptures and what it says, but then you're getting to hear it through their eyes uh, when they clinically died and then came back and what they were saying about it. And, and, what, and I tried to focus on the commonality. So in other words, it wasn't just one person saying that. It was oh, no. multiple people saying that. Yes. The, the colors being so vibrant, um, their senses being a lot more clear. Like they, they, when they come back, they say that this life is almost a dream state compared to when they're in the spirit. Yeah, um, that's right. It, you're, you're right, though. There's, and I'll let you continue, but it's it, there. There probably is more than than forty, but those are one of the key attributes that I really pick up on a lot of these when I'm trying to discern if they are being legitimate or not. But you're so correct on how many. There's just like clockwork. They'll say these certain things every time. Uh, and it, like you said, it's not just one or two, it's all of them. Yeah. Hmm. And, I, and I think that's, that's why it's important. That's why I feel called to, uh, because if you, if you go out on YouTube, you know, it's like it's blowing up. I mean, over the last really just three or four years, yeah, just all these people, all these channels about mere, near-death experiences getting millions of views and... Um, and, and yet, it's so important that we make sense of them in light of what God's been revealing all along. What I like to say, you know, and that's a big reason I wrote this new book, Imagine the God of Heaven, because God didn't just all of a sudden decide, like, hey, guys, here I am, you know, <laughs> I'm, I, it's finally the age of, you know, medical resuscitation, so I'm going to show up. You know, he's, he's been revealing himself all along. Right. And that's what I'm really showing in the, in the new book is people from every single continent and every cultural background, the God they are experiencing in their near death experience is the God of the Bible. Yes. And it's, it's phenomenal. It is. It's, it's, you nailed it on the head because I'll see folks that have had NDEs that were of Hindu faith or Muslim faith, and it's it's a pivotal changing moment in their life. Yeah, well, um, guy who became a good friend of mine, um, his name is Santosh, he was a manufacturing engineer, grew up Hindu, uh, and then has his, his heart coded. So he hears code blue, code blue, they rush in, he mm. leaves his body, one of the commonalities, right? Yeah. And, and this brilliant light comes brighter than the sun, like times a thousand, yeah. also what they commonly say. Yeah. Um, but not hard to look at. Right. In fact, mesmerizing to look at. And, and then he said, you know, I, I knew that this light had superior authority. I, I knew that I had to obey this light. But I also knew that this, this was a divine light, and I fell in love with this light because I knew he was for me and going to protect me. Yeah. So then he takes him, and he takes them on this, on this journey, um, and, and through, you know, he, he calls them tunnels. Um, I don't know if exactly it was like that, but he comes to a place where this, this God of light parks over what he calls this giant compound. And so now he's outside what he calls this giant compound looking in and he's describing it. And he, he, he now I've been to India m many times cause we helped uh, the, the church I helped found built a hospital there and there are compounds everywhere. They're like big walled, yeah. you know, square rectangular compounds. Yeah. And he said, but this compound was like thousands of miles. And he said, over there, your, your eyes are telescopic. Like you can, you can see thousands of miles. That's exactly. another commonality. Yeah. And they can, and, uh, and, and, and little side note, you know, um, what I like to point out is that uh, many times Christians think that the, the stuff is not in the Bible, but it, it actually is. You know, if you think about it, John in Revelation 
is he says he's taken up into heaven and he's taken up on a, a, a great high mountain overlooking the city, right? The city of God. And he describes that city and he says he can read the names on the foundation stones and over the gates. Yeah. How? Yeah. Because he can. Because <laughs> he has this, this telescopic vision. And this is one of the things they say is you're, 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 you're not, you don't have five senses. It's more like you have 50 senses. Yeah. It's like, you know, uh, so, so anyway, Santosh, he's, he's just one of these, but he is actually standing there describing the, the city of God, the new Jerusalem that John described in Revelation 21. He tells me it has these high walls and they're just beautiful walls. Inside is just gorgeous uh, grounds and these, these buildings of otherworldly building material. And, and he used the word mansions. Mansions, buildings of otherworldly building material. And, and he said, and 12 gates. I counted them. There wow. were 12 gates all around this compound that was in the shape of a square. Okay, now so wow. far he is, he is exactly described Revelation 21, and he's never read the Bible. He's only read the Hindu scripture. <laughs> wow. And then he said, I see, I long to go into this place. I long to go into this place, um, but the gates were closed to me. And he said, and I see an angel, angels on the outside of the nearest gate guarding, and then I knew I'm looking at the kingdom of heaven. So he, he has this whole experience then where, where he also gets a vision of hell. He yeah. sees God Almighty on his throne. He's sent back, um, and, and he starts seeking. And, I mean, it's, it's, it's an incredible story. I won't give it away because the whole story, you know, is in the book. But, I mean, he, he comes to faith in Jesus and yeah. starts reading the Bible, and he says, everything I experienced is in this book. Wow. Now, not just Santosh, but I've got like five other Hindus who see the same God. One, one guy who is a chief anesthesiologist, um, raised Hindu, he also starts off having a hellish experience and cries out in repentance to God. He said that's, those were his words. Then he's taken... By these two angels that he identified as Christian angels, which kind of confused him, to this place of great beauty in in before this God of light, brighter than the sun, same thing, love, gives him a life review. That's another commonality. Yeah. So so just like Peter said, 2 Peter 3 8, to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what indie ears say. They yeah. say, you know, you're Time works different over there. And yeah. so they relive their lives and he sees all his sins and he thinks he's going to send me back to hell. It's what I deserve. But instead, God says, I'm, I'm sending you back right, um, to tell right everybody you, I'm sending you back. And yeah, and he and he and he and he shows them again that the changes have to be made. Now, one thing that. Well, let me, let me say this. And then he later sees the same God of light. And he asks, who are you, Lord? And out of the light steps a man with a beard and a robe <laughs> and, and says, I'm Jesus, your Savior. Wow. Now, here, wow. here's the thing. And I, what I like to point out. So this is just like Paul on the Damascus Road. Because sometimes Christians get tripped up by this. Because they're like, well... Why would, why would God appear, you know, to people who don't even believe in him, you know, or, or aren't, aren't Christians? Well, because he's the God of all nations. Genesis chapter 12, he raises, you know, I actually, and, I kind of have a question along those regards, um, yeah, yeah, cause yeah, this yeah, is something Christopher and I have talked about is do NDEs, have you done, have you done any numbers um, collected any statistics on the amount of like Christians who have NDEs who are already saved uh, versus those who are unsaved. And because I was theorizing, I wonder if these aren't like the last ditch effort to save somebody um, from the spiritual realm to where like a uh, Christian is less likely to have an NDE, uh, whereas somebody who's non-Christian. Have you ever done any statistics on something like that? I mean, there's, there's no statistical difference. And and I think the important thing to understand, and, and this is what, 
you know, I studied these 35 years before I wrote my first book for a reason. Because hmm. there's a lot of confusing stuff, <laughs> right? There <Yeah>. is. <laughs> there is. And, 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 you know, that's why I'm trying to show how, how it ties to Scripture. Because... You know, people have an experience, and it's an experience beyond our dimensionalities. Beyond so, comprehension. Yeah, so, so imagine we're living this, this life of three dimensions, but imagine if we were living it on a flat black and white painting in your living room, okay? Yeah. So we're two-dimensional creatures. We can only go up and down and side to side. And then death means separation. So at death, you're flat image is peeled off that two dimensional world and now brought out into this three dimensional realm that was all around you, but you had no concept of it because you didn't have an in or out. You didn't have a third dimension and you experienced hmm. three dimensions of color. And then imagine getting pressed back into your flat two dimensional world. And you have to explain three dimensions of color and that experience in two dimensional black and white terms incomprehensible mm. and that's exactly what indie ears tell me it's yeah. like that that's exactly right so you're so they're experiencing things that are be that are in a fourth a fifth a sixth dimension i don't know how many but <clears throat> the point is they are reporting things but they also are interpreting things so what they commonly report is is consistent and that's where you can find that 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 kernel of truth that you, that you can see how it aligns with the scriptures but sometimes they'll take that same thing they report and then they'll interpret it and and i can i can give you examples of it but let me go back to the point about i like to point out to christians that paul um was not a believer in jesus he was arresting christians and having them persecuted thrown in jail yep. even killed when the same brilliant God of light appeared to him, Acts 9, Damascus Road, right? Yep. And, and I, I like to point out as well that Jesus does not explain the gospel. He doesn't tell Paul what to do. He later sends Ananias to tell Paul and explain the message. And then Paul still has a free will. He had a lot to lose as a Pharisee. So he had to decide still, will I, will I put my faith in Jesus? Because I'm going to lose a lot, but now, now I know. And, and that's important because just because these indie ears have a positive experience, or maybe it starts positive, or, or experience the presence of God, that doesn't mean that's their eternal destiny. Right. And that doesn't mean they're right with God. And they are coming back, and they still have a free will, and they can either choose to seek him and find him, like, like Santosh, or... They can choose to go their own way. Yeah. No, it's it, the ones that fascinate me the most are the ones that experience hell. I don't know why, but it puts the fear of God in me because their descriptions are always so consistent about how horrible it smells, how high the temperature is. It's beyond sustainable life. Um, it's just, it's, it's so much that the visualization that you that you have makes you want to be right with God. Yeah, and and in this new book, you know, I've I've got um, Santosh who has also sees a vision of hell um, before Jesus before God shows him this narrow door that he says a narrow gate that was open into the kingdom of God. <laughs> Isn't that, hmm. that crazy? And he comes back seeking, like, I want to go through that narrow gate. What is that narrow gate? Yeah. Um, you know, we, I've got, I've got people in the book from Tehran, Bibi, hmm. who was a Muslim, has a heart attack. And the same God that Santosh saw, who's, who is in the form of a man, um, but regal, and actually huge, uh, comes and says to her, I am he who is. Hmm. Which is exactly what this God of light on Mount Sinai says to Moses. Yeah. I am, I am who I am. That was the translation. She actually told it to me in, in Farsi, and it was translated 
uh, into English, I am he who is. But basically, I'm the self-existent one. Heidi uh, was a young Jewish girl who grew up with a dad who was abusive and an, and an atheist. And every night told her, uh, there is no God. Your life is worthless. Jesus Christ is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. And uh, every night, though, despite that, she believed in God and she prayed to God every night. And she felt like God not only was listening, but, but was, was basically putting her to sleep as a child through all these abuses. Then at 16, her horse rears back, falls over a cliff, lands on her and crushes her. She dies. She knows she's dead. She's up 30 feet above watching her sisters freak out. Yeah. And she sees a light over her right shoulder and realizes, okay, that can't be the sun. It's a cloudy day. What is that? And turns and looks and there floating with her 30 feet up is Jesus, but, but bright as the sun, but Jesus, she knew. And she said, yeah. I did, I didn't say, why am I with Jesus? What's a good Jewish girl like me doing with Jesus? I'm not supposed to be with Jesus. She said, no, I knew him. She said, this was the man that yeah. God that I had prayed to my whole life. It was like this great reunion. And then Jesus gives her a life review. And in the life review, she's reliving. So a life review, they, they basically have a panoramic replay. Yeah. They watch Everything. their life over again. Yeah. But, but not just remembering all that they thought and felt, they also experienced what other people thought and felt. Yeah. And the interactions, the ripple effect of that. How it so affected the... How it affects Yeah, but, but she's watching this and she sees herself as a little girl praying and going to sleep at night and she sees Jesus sitting by the bed just like she pictured it. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, we're talking about, and this is just a few. I mean, I've got Swedik was an imam in Rwanda. Same thing, you know, he, he dies of blood cancer. He is in a hellish experience, but his mom, who, who oh, wow. was, a, who was a, um, basically an African witch, witch doctor, dad was a sheik and a mom. He had become an imam. Um, he dies of blood cancer. His mom, because nothing could help him, goes to the Christian Anglican church to see if they will pray. And she's praying with them for Jesus, the God of the Christians, to save her son. And into this hellish place, Swedik says, comes this man in a, in, a, in a white robe, bursting forth light like the sun that shoots into his eyes. And he holds out his hands and he sees the nail holes in his hands. Wow. And that's when he wow. knew who it was because he had seen the passion of the Christ when it came to, uh, to Rwanda. And he said to him, I died for mankind. You are among those I died for. Never deny it and tell it to everyone. And, and Swedik, he's, he's an awesome guy. He's a young guy. He's now an Anglican priest, and he's had seven attempts on his life because he won't stop wow. talking about Jesus. Wow. And he's still in Rwanda. Hmm. You know, one of the common commonalities, like you mentioned, is the communication is telepathic instead of verbally talking. Right. Um, exactly. not, only, not only that, like you said, with the telescopic view, uh, they could look at someone, let's say, 100 yards away, and by zooming in on them, now knows everything about that person and their well, feelings yeah. and their emotions. Yeah, it's, it's really a... Um it's a heightened experience of life. This yeah. is a very muted experience of life, you yeah. know, of the good and the bad. Right. It's, it's muted in both ways. And I think God did that on purpose. He's, he's, he's put us in a time capsule of choosing, you know, we're, we're choosing whether we want God to rule and reign or not. It's, yeah. it's the knowledge we're living in the knowledge of good and evil, right? Absolutely. You know, like it says in Genesis, and, and, um, but, but yeah, the, um, people's senses, um, they, they are blended as well, which, which is kind of strange. It's hard, hard to imagine, but they say, you know, the sights have, have smells and the sounds have, 
you know, smells yes. or uh, it, the senses are all blended. Yeah. And, and, the, and the communication is not just, some use the word teles- telepathic, but they really say, no, it's even more than that. It's pure. So it's like when you try to communicate with someone, you know, we have to use words and you're thinking more words than I can say. And so there's all kinds of myths going on. But in heaven, it's like everything I'm thinking, feeling, and all the associated things that got me there and are going to go from there are all just in you and you get it fully. Boom. Yeah, it's all, it's all knowing. It's, it's wild. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's incredible. Yeah. It reminds me of, you know, when, when, when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, now we see in a mirror dimly, you know, uh, but then we will, uh, we, know, we know in part, but then we will know in full, even as we are fully known. Yeah. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. you know, it, one thing that in one of the NDEs that I studied, you know how they say they come out of their body and they go up into the atmosphere and they go through a tunnel, what seems like at the speed of light. One of them made it seem like when you look up in the night sky, you can actually see heaven because it's one of those stars. Because you travel so fast to get wherever you're going and through their travel experience in the tunnel, that tiny little star eventually gets closer and closer and bigger and bigger. And he alluded to when you look up in the night sky, you're actually one of those little tiny stars is heaven. Do you know who said that? I've never heard that. No, but think about it. Cause but, well, I'll tell you what I have. I, you know, there, there's a lot that over the years has really changed my, it hasn't changed my theology. It's just enlivened it in ways that, some things that it's right there in the Bible, but I never would have uh, thought that that was to be taken seriously. Right. Um, I'll, I'll give you some examples, but one of them here is what you're talking about. So when people die, they leave their bodies, yes, and they're typically above their body in the place of, of the resuscitation, which, right. which if we want to go to evidence, that's where a lot of evidence can be found because they, right. they see things they should not have been able to see and they ground their experience in our reality. Yeah. You know, so, but then they travel and some say it's a tunnel and sometimes it's a dark tunnel, but sometimes it's, it, it's, it's light, but some just travel like through our atmosphere and then out into outer space. And then they're like just shooting through the stars and through the galaxies. Right. And, and then they come to a place. So this, this might be what you're referring to. They come to a place of light that some have said is kind of like a, a, a planet, but not anything like our planets. Right. Um, hmm. It's, it's, it's golden. It's, enormous yeah. um and and there are i mean they describe it different ways in the, in the first book imagine heaven at the end i i put some of that in there of different ways they've described it but i don't think that can be seen now that's just my theory yeah but i i, I, I think i think what what we're experiencing is that all of our physical reality, what we call the universe, is actually within a greater world, universe, um, that, that, again, exists all around us, in essence, because it's in other dimensions all around us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the spiritual dimension is literally right here on the other side. It's it's yeah. it's it's that close to crossing over, from what I understand. Well, and think about it. You know, Paul talked about being taken to the third heaven, right? So I yeah. think Paul might have had a near death experience. You think about it in in Acts chapter fourteen. Paul is stoned to death in Lystra, and they drag him out of the city and leave him for dead. Hmm. And then he, the the believers rally around him and pray for him, and he gets back up. And he goes back into the city. So he's obviously feeling good, you know, which after <laughs> being stoned to death, 
You know, I don't think you normally would. But yeah. the point is, in yeah. 2 Corinthians 12, he says, 14 years ago, talking about himself, whether in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Now, why does he say that? Because we still have a spiritual body. And yes. we're still ourselves. In fact, in fact, people are so themselves when they die, sometimes they don't know they died. Yes, they don't because recognize they, their physical bodies. Well, they just don't realize that anything is substantially changed initially. Yeah. Um, but but huh. then he said, I, Paul said, I was taken up into the third heaven, and I saw and I heard things inexpressible and things yeah. no one's allowed to tell. Now, the first heaven in you know the ancient world was the, the stars of the sky, what we see, right, in the physical mm -hmm. realm. The second heaven is like you were saying, it's the, it's the dimensionality of the spiritual realm all around us. And it is where Satan and the fallen angels were cast to rule for a time. It's why Satan could offer Jesus the kingdoms of the earth, because this is his realm. The third heaven, I believe, is that place where the New Jerusalem, the city of God, God the Father on the throne, manif is manifested there visibly for the inhabitants of heaven. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we've we've talked about this on the show quite a lot. Um, we have a video series on the uh, seven seals. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've seen it, but <clears throat> something in there that's really interesting that you might find interesting is... If you were to change your perspective as if you're, say, on Polaris, the no North Star, and you're looking down at Earth at the North Pole, the uh, Earth is surrounded by a green rainbow called the Aurora Borealis. Mm -hmm. And from that perspective, you can see four constellations that match the living creatures. Uh, Leo the lion, uh, Taurus the bull or calf, Ophiuchus, you only see his face, and then um, Aquila, the flying eagle. And that's one of the reasons why we've talked about, I almost wonder if when people are experiencing this traveling through a tunnel, like John, when he said he saw a window opened in heaven and a voice mm -hmm. said, come up here. Mm -hmm. um, if they're not like traveling to like this third heaven and that's not the perspective looking down on the earth. Yeah, I think that's very probable. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I know. It's mind blowing, really. I mean, you it know, really when, is. and, and, uh, I mean, there are things that, uh, well, there's some things that they tell me because I've interviewed a lot of people and, and they'll tell me it. And I'm kind of like, Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm still no. skeptical at nature. I yeah. am. I don't believe everything everybody says. I'm Absolutely. always looking for points of data. Like, okay, maybe, um, like I'll give you one. That, that this one, quite, uh, quite honestly, uh, it, it really, it, it really kind of threw me for a while. Um, was that God the Father on His throne is huge? I mean, huge. I'm mean, building size, huge. Hmm. And they can't, they don't see His face because it's just bright. It's it's so bright you can't you can't look. But he but he does have the the shape, I guess, of of a man. Um, hmm. And, and so at first I was like, yeah, that kind of just sounds like the old, you know, like cartoon, big, big old man, God in the sky. And so I kind of put it on the shelf. But when you have Hindus like Santosh who see the same guy, <laughs> when you have, you know, uh, a Colombian woman, Karina, same, same description, a commercial airline pilot. Um, and they're and they're saying they're saying the same thing that uh, that God the Father and I and I believe God the Father believe that God is spirit and so so God is everywhere it's it's the theological term imminent God is everywhere right. and He's sustaining everything yeah. but. He incarnated in the person of Jesus for the inhabitants of earth. And I believe he manifests as God the Father on his throne for the inhabitants of heaven. But he's not limited to either locale, if that makes sense. It's a very but, complex. You know, just, it's very complex. Oh, it is. Yeah. It is. You know, but, but, but unfathomable. 
Yeah. So hearing things like that over and over again, and then I read Isaiah 6, you know, and, and you read Ezekiel 1, and you find out, yeah, they said the same thing. That he, he's, he's in the form of a man, but his face is so bright you can't see it, and he's, and he's big. <laughs> he's not, you know, he's not Jesus size. Right. So there are things like that that, quite honestly, you know, my skeptical self was like, I don't think so. Because it didn't fit my, what, right. what I wanted to think. But when I kept hearing, I mean, we're talking many, many in the ears and yeah. people who didn't have any biblical background saying the same thing. Then I start to go, okay, well, maybe there's something here. And then you start to really look at the Bible and it's like, oh, it, it's there anyway. Yeah. I'll give you one more that's, uh, that really kind of blew my mind. Um, so it says in the Psalms, it talks about that. You know, the heavens will burst forth the praises of God and the, you know, the, the trees and the mountains and the, the flowers will sing forth his praises. They literally right? do. They literally do. They literally do. Yes. And, and it wasn't until, you know, like I'm here in Heidi, that Jewish girl who Jesus then takes to God, the father who, who is huge. And then he shows her, he shows her heaven and she's saying, I, I'll never forget the grass singing, swaying exactly. in the wind, singing <laughs> his is. praises and the people singing huh. his praises. And, Absolutely. And, and it wasn't just her, you know, it was like again it's and not. again and again until I was finally like, well, shoot, that man, okay, I would have never taken that literally. Yeah, I thought the, that was just a metaphor. The nature in heaven from everything that I've collected is... Everything is perfect. There's no dead grass or leaves falling off of trees. Everything is perfectly bloomed, perfectly flowered, and the grass will be maybe a foot tall and will be swaying, praising God as it does. Well, Interesting. and even, even wilder than that, um, you know, like Dean Braxton told me, he said, it's not only that, um, that everything is alive, but you know how on earth, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the second law of thermodynamics. Everything tends toward positive entropy. It goes to chaos, you know, your garage, your closet, your car, <laughs> you know, your body, everything deteriorates. Everything is breaking down and deteriorating. Right. And in heaven, it's the opposite. Right. Everything's hmm. increasing and growing and getting better because, so, so this is another commonality, the light of heaven, there is no sun or moon. Right. The light is coming out of everything. Yes. And it is not just light, it is life and it is love, love. all palpably together. Yes. And, 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 and here's another just fascinating thing. So I have multiple people in Imagine the God of Heaven, the new book, who were blind. But when they had a near-death experience, they can see. They can see. And they right. see the same things. Yeah. And now if this isn't another just incredible, tangible, uh, tangible evidence of this being true, the blind people say the same things the sighted people do, that, that there, there, was no, there was no sun or moon but light came out of this one blind girl said light was coming out of the grass and out of the trees and out of the birds and, and out even of out hair. of the people, even out, out of, of the hair. people. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what Isaiah 60 says that there is no sun or moon because God is its light. Revelation 21. He says, there's no sun or moon. The glory of God is its light and the lamb Jesus is its lamp and the nations will walk in that light. Wow. And so this is the light. This is the glory of God giving life and love and light to everything. And so God is so creative. Everything is continuing to be creatively infused and grow and even get better. It's I can't wait to read your book. Uh, it, it, sounds like you, 
it sounds like you make all the correlations with all the NDE experiences and connect it with scripture where it, it in the past someone may have thought that the scripture was not being literal but it literally is yeah hmm. or or where people thought you know oh that's just way out there you know crazy new age yeah. whatever you want to label it but I'm showing how no no in fact you know if you really study the scriptures this is in there this yeah. is this is what we would expect. Yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I've always said that I take the scripture literally. Some folks have to have that hard evidence, uh, which is totally understandable because people's minds work differently. Well, and I still think you know. I still think there is, you know, like I. I, I mean, there are metaphors and similes and poems and songs there's different genre that god used in writing the scriptures so when he says you know god will protect you under the under his wings like a mother hen protects her chicks well that doesn't mean he literally is going to flap his wings and, and that he has feathers right right and so i don't i don't that's what that's why the thing with the singing grass kind of threw me because <laughs> i i don't take everything wooden literal i take it serious and what it was meant to say, but I would have thought that that was poet poetry and metaphor, but yeah. indie ears convinced me otherwise, which is really wild. It is. <clears throat> it, it it really is. Watch. You think a lot like some? I do. Uh, yeah, I'm a I'm an engineer by trade as well. I I, oh, I, I I'm the same way. Yeah. So I, I look at both the figurative and the literal. That's how I came to what I understood about Revelation four. Um, is by thinking about, you know, what else could this mean? What if this was literally talking? Because the most common understanding, the most common narrative about Revelation 4 is this is what it looks like in heaven. And it matches, you know, in a lot of cases what people see in NDEs. And I, I'm the type of person that I'm like, well, let's look at it from a different angle. What if this is, you know, painting a picture of something that is literal? And which is really common in Hebrew reasoning, which a lot of the mm. people, even though they, they wrote Greek, they were Hebrew by, you know, uh, their their backgrounds right and um oftentimes when writing there's there's depth and multiple meanings and not necessarily one specific meaning to something when they write you know there's you know that's one of the great things right. about parables is parables span so many different categories and there's so many lessons in them but yeah, yeah it seems like it seems like that's an engineer trade because i hear a lot of a lot of people who are trying to solve these end time puzzles that's one of the things they say is i'm an engineer by trade <laughs> i know well it's just it is it's the way your mind works it's like you see all these all mm -hmm. these the uh, patterns and you and you want to go like how does that fit Yep. And it is. It's the way. It's the way God wired me, and I, it was just a nuisance for many, many years. And now I understand why. It was. It was. It was one of those things where it's like, okay, why am I? Why do I care about this so much? You know, like yeah, like I would run into him, and then I, I would then study it, and then I'd chronicle it, and then I'd take it apart, and I'd take the other one apart, and I'd put the pieces together, and you know, I just kept doing that. Yeah. Hey, I'm grabbing more coffee. You guys keep talking. All right. Sure. <laughs> what kind of engineering? Uh, software engineer. I'm an enterprise uh, uh, developer. I build stuff like Facebook. Awesome. Yeah. Stuff like or Facebook? No, no. Stuff like. I don't work for Facebook. I've, okay. I've, I've built um, enterprise social networks for probably the last 15 years. So, oh, like, uh, cool. big companies with, you know, 100,000 employees have their own in-house version right, of a social right, right. network. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. The, um, if you get a chance, you should check out that, um, the series that we did on the seven seals. It's really interesting. Um, oh, well. I, I present my case that I think we're probably, uh, between seal three and four based on the evidence of what's in revelation, um, one through about 12. Um, where Revelation 12 is the anchor point that tells us that we're living in the end times right now because of, uh, I'm sure you're aware of the Revelation 12 sign that happened on September 23rd, 2017. Yeah, I got, a, I got a full uh, debriefing by, by Jimmy Evans at, at uh, lunch yeah. after he interviewed me. 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those things that it's so rare that it couldn't mean anything else. Like uh, I've personally checked fourteen thousand years using you know astro- um, um, stellarium mm-hmm. um, to actually check the star movements, and that's that sign as described in the Book of Revelation only happens on that one day. So that mm-hmm. is pretty significant for a sign. Uh, so taking that as an anchor point and saying, well, I wonder what else could be in the heavens that we could look for that might, you know, that we can start to reverse engineer the book of Revelation. And mm-hmm. it turns out that, you know, Revelation 4, while it could be a, a figurative representation of what it's like in heaven, it would stand to reason that God may actually have patterned his creation after more than one thing. So, well, that's how I was able to, you know, I can't remember what it was. I was watching a, a YouTube video and somebody was talking about the Aurora Borealis and I just, I clicked like green rainbow from Revelation 4 and that just sent me down this path of looking at these things in the stars. And that's where I found that perspective to where if you look down at the earth and you can do this in Stellarium, you can look down at uh, the North Pole and you'll see those constellations that match the four living creatures. It's really fascinating. But based on that, so what do you think that means? The, the, I think it's a celestial clock because um, I noticed that eclipses were happening on, on days that matched the seals being opened in Revelation 6. So, for instance, uh, the rider on the white horse going forth conquering and to conquer, there was an eclipse on December 26, 2019 that was in Sagittarius. It was a, the corona one that looks like a crown. It was above Sagittarius's head, and Sagittarius is the rider with the bow uh, on the horse. And he just happens to be right underneath Aquila, the um, the flying eagle. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, okay, so you have a living creature that's uh, in association with this eclipse. And then I, so I plotted that out. And then there was another one that happened next year, December 14th, 2020. The Electoral College declared the, the current president, the winner of the election. Um, there was an eclipse that day same day that the electoral college did that. And it was also the same day that the uh, operation warp speed was given to the, uh, handed over to the Biden administration. Also the same day that the very first jab was actually given. So um, I thought, okay, so that could be the power, the rider on the red horse receiving the power to take peace or the authority to take peace from the earth. And he's given a great sword, which considering the amount of damage that was done because of the jab and, you know, the requirements to, to take it, how many businesses were closed down. It was, I, you could argue that that was used like a weapon. So, mm. yeah, so I continue that pattern and it looks like, so then I got to thinking, well, how the heck can eclipses be the 24 elders? And that led me to thinking, well, okay, so the sun and the moon have been around since the very beginning, since Genesis 14, right? 114. Uh, uh, he set the sun, moon, and stars for signs, seasons, days, and years. So I guess you have the sun that rules over 12 hours of the day, and you have the moon that rules over 12 hours of the day. So together, they make a 24-hour period of time. And then the earth is divided into 24 time zones. And it's 24,000 miles around the entire Earth. So you've got so many of these references to 24 that I'm like, I guess I could see how the sun and the moon, when they come together, that could potentially be them casting their crown before the throne. So that's how I ended up coming to the conclusion. The only thing that makes sense, if you're looking at it from a from the um, heavenly context. I do a video called The Heavenly Context when I'm talking about these things because there seems to be a scriptural context and there also seems to be a heavenly context. So when, you know, these things are in reference to stuff in heaven, it would seem like that that would make sense that um, the 24 elders could be ours. And, the you know, to my point about things having multiple meanings, that's not saying that the 24 elders only mean ours. Uh, the creator could have patterned that after literally 24 elders who will be in charge at the end mm-hmm. of time or something like that. Maybe it's mm-hmm. a combination of, you know, the apostles and the, you know, whatever. There's there's so many different interpretations of that, but very fascinating study. That is fascinating. I'll have to check that out. I, yeah. I really look forward to reading your book. Um, I, I, I'll... 
send you an email afterwards. I would love to have both of those books and, Absolutely. Uh, and, and talk about it because this is a topic that really fascinates me. And there is a lot of folks that are data-driven that really need to see how it ties into Scripture. That's so important um, for some people. Oh, yeah. Well, and, you know, for, for me... Um, I was still skeptical uh, for, for many years of them. I was like, well, okay, but how do we know this isn't just some kind of hallucination or anoxia, you know, when the brain doesn't have enough oxygen, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, fighter, fighter pilot syndrome, or, you know, maybe it's just endorphins flooding the brain and, you know, or maybe it's a trick your brain plays on you. I mean, these are all the, you know, there, there, are, there have been about 30 proposed alternate explanations. Other it's, than, the common, it's the commonalities, though. Well, and, and in Chapter 2 of, of the new book, Imagine the God of Heaven, I go, I go into and I explain that if, if there's going to be an alternate uh, explanation, it needs to take into account these 10 points of evidence that convince me and many skeptical medical doctors that this is real and the simple explanation is Occam's razor, right? The, the, right? the simplest explanation is the one you should go with unless there's a really good reason not to. And the simplest explanation that every ND ear gives is our soul survives our body's death. We yeah. live on in a, in a world more real. But, you know, so um, just to give you a few of those for, you know, maybe some of the listeners are, you know, still skeptical, like, why should we even trust these NDEs? Like I said, when people first die, they're out of their body. Um, They still have a body, like Paul was saying, it's a spiritual body, but they're usually in the room where their resuscitation is taking place. Correct. And as a result, they can see um, what is going on and report that when they come back. Exactly. Yeah, mm-hmm. Like, for instance, in the new book, there's a woman in London. She's die- she dies in childbirth, giving childbirth. She's up above. She sees what's going on in the room and all that. And then she floats up through the ceiling. And she goes to, you know, similar to what we were talking about, this heavenly place. And in the presence of God, he tells her, it's not your time. Your son, Michael, is going to live. He's gonna- he needs you. You got to go back. She begs to not go back because, you know, Mm. that's everybody says this. And that's that's the subtitle of of the new book, Uh, Imagine the God of Heaven, which is near-death experiences, God's revelation, and the love you've always wanted. Because that's what that's what we don't realize is God is the is the friend and the and the love and the you know the get us better than anybody that we've always longed for. And that's why they don't want to leave. So she does leave and she comes back and as she's coming back into the room of her, where, where the, the operation's happening, she passes through the ceiling fan and on the top side of the ceiling fan notices a red sticker. Oh no. She, she, she's resuscitated and she starts telling him about this incredible experience with God. And of course they all think she's psychotic and you know, it's just right. drugs. And, and she, and then she, tr- she tells one of the nurses, here's what you said and here's what you did. And she's kind of freaked out. And she's like, Oh, how did you know that? Cause you were unconscious. You were right. gone. And, mm-hmm. and she said, look, I'll prove it to you. Go get a ladder and look on the top side of that ceiling fan. There's a red sticker and here's what it says on it. And I remember nurse, that one. Yeah. The nurse goes and gets it. And sure enough, it's there. Now that's, that's one point of observation, right? There's so many. But they make multiple observations. So a study, Dr. Janice Holden did a study on people who had cardiac arrest, who had near-death experiences, and people who had cardiac arrest that didn't claim to have a near-death experience, and, the, and, and really focused on the verifiable observations. And so of the, of the observations that people having a near-death experience made, she found that 92% were completely accurate. So in other wow. words, each one may have 10 observations, 92% completely accurate. Another 6% were, 
were mostly accurate, 2% were wrong, which turned out to be one person in the study. Wow. So Hmm. you're talking about incredibly evidential, verifiable information that these people should not have been able to, to, to know or see because they don't have brain waves many times. So where, yeah. where is this perception happening? Right? Good point. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. S- second, second point of evidence out of, out of my 10, and I won't go through all 10, but second point I've already said is that blind people can see. And like I said, they say things like the light of heaven coming out of everything. Well, where would hmm. they have heard that the, that light comes out of things? It, they would have heard on earth it shines on things. So right. why would they consistently say that? Right? Mm. Third, um, you've got all these commonalities, right? Like a life review, meeting deceased relatives, um, encountering this God of, of light and love. Um, but if it's just something happening in the brain, it's just a human thing at the point of death, why wouldn't it be 100% for all people? When in fact, what you find is 30% come to a border or boundary they knew they couldn't cross and still come back. 57% see relatives who had already passed on. Right. Um, You know, about about 30% have a life review. 48% see the same God of light and love. So they're commonalities and they overlap but they don't perfectly overlap. So that doesn't make any sense of of, of a brain based explanation. Right. Yeah. There's, there's some that, that really, uh, really uh, give me the chills, especially when they recognize someone in heaven that they don't know on earth. And then when they get back later on, they're looking through photo albums, and it turns out that was their great, great, great grandfather that they had never met, but recognized him from a hundred year old picture. Yeah. And that's and that's my fourth point of evidence, actually. Like Debbie, this woman who was blind from birth, um, she she not only when she leaves her body, she she drops to the floor, passed out, dropped to the floor, unconscious. And her mom comes running in when she hears the crash. And this is the first time she's ever seen her mom. And so when she comes back to her body, first of all, she's able to describe her mom. But she also said, you were wearing a robe and it was a dark color. And she wow. said, yeah, it was, my, it was my black robe. So then Debbie travels and she's again in this beautiful place uh, with, with God. But she also... God, who also tells her, you, you have to go back, you're going to have children. Well, she'd been told she couldn't have children. But she comes back and she does have children. Yeah. And then she meets her grandmother on the other side, who she had never met in life, because her grandmother died when she was just an infant. And when she comes back, she's describing to her mother what her grandmother looked like. And her mom says, well, yeah, that's exactly what she looked like. But when she was 30, which is another commonality. Mm. Yes. The the people people in heaven heaven typically are in their prime. They're exact. Yeah. They're in their prime of their life. Not too old, not too young. Yeah. Before their body starts to degrade. Yeah. Hey, you you had made a comment. You had made a comment in, in, in the beginning that some people misinterpret their NDE um, experiences. We had a guest on the show who was describing his NDE experiences. He had more than one. And some of the things he came away from um, are just so far out of the ordinary that Christopher was like, I think this guy was deceived. Have, mm. have, do you have any experience with people who may have been deceived by an NDE and it ended up having negative effects on their life and, and the direction that they're going? Yeah. So um, in, in the new book, I, I give a couple examples um, of maybe on the one hand reporting something that is accurate, but interpreting it differently. So, yeah. so, so, like I said, I have, I have multiple Hindus who see the same God of light and love, who the same, same God who appeared on Mount Sinai, you know, uh, Jesus, when he's transfigured, you know, 
brighter than the sun. Um, he said, I'm the light of the world. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, it's the same guy. So Nia um, was attacked by a lion in Africa and wow. bites her on the head. She leaves her body. Um, and here's what she says. She says, I went to this amazing, beautiful place. Some call it heaven. Some call it God. The glow was like the sun, fire, light, morning. This glow guided me to my safety. God definitely exists. Hmm. Now, when she comes back, she interprets this sun, light, glow as the goddess Durga. And, and as a right. Hindu, she worshiped the goddess Durga. Now, Durga is described usually as a woman riding a lion with eight to ten arms and weapons in each hand. Okay, that's right. not who Nia saw. Who she hmm. saw is the same as the God of light and love that has been revealing himself throughout history. You know, and that, that's exactly right. what I'm trying to show. But she also said she came back with an understanding of Jesus and Christianity, which she had known nothing about. Hmm. So, so she has an experience that she reports, but she also has an interpretation based on her own cultural Personal world beliefs. Views. Yeah. Arvind is another one. He was an Indian who died in a hospital floats up out in the hallway. He sees this brilliant, huge light. Okay. And, and then he comes back and he says that was the goddess uh, Kalika or Kali. Okay. But right. again, Kali is a black or blue woman with four arms and a long black tongue. That's the typical description. So that's nothing like what Arvin described, but he was describing the same God of light and love that the Bible talks about. Hmm. So, so, so yes. Um, and, and, and there's another point to what you were saying. So sometimes people have what I would call a shallow experience. So if you think about it, you know, there are all these commonalities, but if someone leaves their body and they're up observing the resuscitation, they feel great. You know, they have multiple senses like never before. Um, and then they go back into their body. Now they can interpret that in a hundred thousand different ways. Right. I'm an atheist. Yeah. Look, atheists go to heaven. It was great. In fact, w- one of the interpretive keys I found is a, f- who's a good friend of mine now was an atheist and he died. And he has that exact experience is he's, he's in the room. He doesn't know he's dead because he thought dead was unplugged the computer lights out. Right. Ceased to so exist. he, so he's there and he's like, feels like Superman. He feels awesome. Huh. And then these really nice people come in the hallway. That's another commonality is usually yep. a, a welcoming committee yep. of people usually who have died before you and they've come to greet you. And, and by the way, what indie ears have commonly told me is I knew they were there to, to g- love me and, and greet me and guide me to heaven and to protect me. And I'd always ask them, protect you from what? And right, that's my say, first I, question. I don't know. No. They huh. consistently say, I don't know. I just knew intuitively they were there to protect me. The demonic so, spirits that are well, lingering around. In the second heaven, in the second realm, it, it is where the spiritual battle is happening. Yes. So this, so this guy, Howard, who's an atheist, initially, it's all good. He feels great, more alive than ever, peaceful. These nice people are in the hallway that come to welcome him. Howard, come with us. We're here for you. You know, we're here to guide you. Oh, yeah. And they start to shift now, gears on him. If he had been resuscitated at that point, he could have interpreted it as, hey, atheists go to heaven there is no God, but they're right. nice people and we just live on. And which by the way is if you listen to mediums, mediums are getting all the same elements of near death experiences minus one. No God. Yeah. Interesting. We are God. There is no God. Almost well, that's what, huh. that's what the enemy wants always. you to think. Yeah. And, and, and so, but Howard ends up following these people. Yeah. And they deceive him and they lead him into this, what he calls this darkness, darker than blast. Yes. 
Something and they start to feel. maul him. Yep. They start to maul him. Yeah. And, and in that experience, he hears inside, pray to God, pray to God. And, and, and this is always, this has always been fascinating to me because it shows you the power of human deception and ego, our pride. It shows you the power yeah. of pride when we harden our hearts against God. Because yeah. here he is getting mauled in this outer darkness, just like Jesus described. And, and it's, it's the most horrific thing ever. And he hears, pray to God, and he's arguing. I don't believe in God. <laughs> what God? Wow. What am I, how, I don't even know how to pray. How do you pray? But he yeah. keeps hearing it. Yeah. And, hmm. and, and finally, he just he remembers the song, Jesus Loves Me, from when he was taken to Sunday school as a kid. Right. And just in desperation, he cries out. He thinks, you know, even if you are, why would you save me? But he just cries out in desperation, Jesus saved me. Yeah. And pinpoint of light yep. comes into this darkness. Suddenly, bright as the sun, arms reach out, grab him, pick him up, and hold him like a baby as he just yeah. sobs. Yeah. And he, wow. you know, he has life review and he comes back and, and he is a pastor. He's a pastor today and, um, and literally Incredible. left, a, left wow, a tenured, a-, a tenured professorship huh. to become a Christian pastor. His wife left him because she was an atheist too. And uh, hey, he lost wow. a lot. Yeah. What a testimony. It is. <laughs> and I've heard that. I've heard that story, but I've heard so many just like it. Yeah. It's really How, incredible. Howard, Howard's an awesome guy. Yeah. He, I'm, I'm he, he followed um, what he thought was a, a nice welcoming committee down the hallway that eventually started getting darker and darker. Yeah. And they got further and further away from him. So he, he had tried to keep up, and eventually it was so dark that he couldn't see the hand in front of his face. And it was so dark, it almost felt like the darkness was alive. Hmm. Yeah. And then he realized they were, they were, they started to taunt him and mock him and deceive yes. him. And, and, and that's the thing that you realize is hell, you know, hell is like C.S. Lewis said, it's God giving the free will creature what he wants when he says, stay out of my life. You know, I, my will be done. Right. Mm. And it's so true. Yeah. And where, where does God honor? And the reason God would honor free will is because God is love and he created us for love and love requires free will. Right. right. It's a necessity. And so he, he honors free will, but where, where is the God who is light and love and life? You know, the place he stays out of is going to be darkness and, you know, void of life. And it's the creature, um, like Howard said, it's, it's dominate or be dominated. Yeah. It's like the worst prison scene. It's not even fathomable. It's, it's, I've, I've watched so many because the hell ones, for some reason, just fascinate me beyond um, anything else because a, again, just like you say, there's so many commonalities, but it it really puts you on fire for the Lord so that you can, you just want to tell everybody so that no one ends up going there because the way it's described by so many people, so many people, it is, it's, it's just truly a horrific place that your mind cannot even imagine. Yeah, and you know, studies studies done of people who have come forward with their NDE, 23% of those who have come forward have reported a near-death experience that was hellish. Hmm. So, you know, I have a whole chapter in the first book, Imagine Heaven, on hellish NDEs because you've got to make sense of those too. You can't just take and that that was that was another thing that I think um tripped up a lot of Christians in the early days of near-death experience study, you know, back in the 80s and 90s when I was studying it, is that no one was coming forward with a hellish experience. Hmm. But think about it. Like, 
I mean, like Howard said to me, at a certain point, he's telling me this, and I've heard it about four times, and he says, you know, honestly, that's as far as I can go because I still have, like, PTSD because these these aren't memories up here that fade, and, and the good ones and the bad ones. They, it's like in their soul, and when they go there, they're there again. It, it, it really real. is. It, it is it scars you it and i have never even i've never had one but just from the ones that i've studied it leaves me wanting to make sure the people i love do not end up there because yeah. it, it it really really sticks with you it really really does i've seen so many of them that it's um it gives me uh, incredible motivation to share the gospel because God does not want anybody to end up there. But like no you said, he gives, he gives free will for folks to make that decision. And you know what's wild in, in, in the new book in Imagine the God of Heaven? Um, I have multiple indie ears that God, in their near-death experience, God let them feel his deep grief and sorrow over his children who rejected him yeah. or who wow. have rejected him. And it's powerful. Mm. It's like, imagine it's powerful. Yeah. I like this one, Erica, she said, she's standing there, you know, and she's like somewhere in space with her back to heaven. She said, and they're looking out and she's feeling just this overwhelming love. Like this is like, there's just no words to express. Our, our word love just doesn't do justice. And, um, and God's showing her her uniqueness and her gifts and the, the ripple effect that each one of our lives can have. And then suddenly she feels this overwhelming sadness, she said, like as if I lost all of my children in, in one moment in an accident. And I'm sitting there just looking. It's like that kind of feeling times 100. And wow. she couldn't figure out where is, where is this feeling coming from? And then she realized, why are you so, that it's coming from God? And she's, why are you so sad? And, it, and, and then he let her see hell. And he let her see the, you know, just kind of the, and feel what he feels of, of people rejecting them because just like you said, hell was not created for people. It was created for eternal angels who wanted a place where they could rule and God wouldn't would stay out. And there's only one place in eternity where God stays out. Yeah. And it wasn't created for people. And, and, you know, like Jesus said, you know, it's not my heavenly father's will that any of them would perish. Yeah. He nailed it. And I, and I like to, you know, I like to remind just anybody listening, maybe who doesn't know this, but you know, God's crazy love for each one of us is incredibly unique so that literally people feel like in his presence, like I'm the only child he loves. <laughs> I'm yes. that, I'm that. And because of that, Jesus went to the cross to pay for all your wrongs, all my wrongs, so that the only thing that can keep us out of heaven, the only thing that can keep us out of relationship with God is our own stubborn pride. Yes. Our own free will saying, hey, it's okay, God, I got this. Yeah. I'm good. And there's so many of them. There's so many of them. Yeah. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you one of them. Now, I don't, I don't think... You know, there's, there's a border or a boundary that near-death experiencers say in their experience, they come to a border or a boundary they knew they couldn't cross and still come back. Yeah. So I don't think this is eternal life or eternal death. I don't think they've crossed over into that eternal life or eternal death. I think this is a peak. Hmm. They're, they're getting a peek at the reality, but they're still tied to their temporal life. And right. I think that's why they can still make decisions that where God rescues them. 
I don't necessarily think that's true after you cross over that border or boundary. Yeah. Hmm. No, I agree. I agree. Wow. I, I, it's, we're so, I'm so glad you came on. Yeah, oh, yeah. thank you. My pleasure. Well, as you can tell, I can talk a long time about this. <laughs> it's 35 yeah, this was great. plus years of thinking about it. So, No, it's absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised Watchful doesn't have more questions. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's nice. So I was, it's only recently, I don't know, since... 2023 maybe that I've even started considering because uh, my understanding was that when you, it was like sleep because it's called sleep in the Old Testament. Um, it, I think it was actually I started reading the book of Enoch because I had stayed away from the book of Enoch. because So I went to school to be a, uh, um, uh, a minister. Uh, I studied theology in college. And the book of Enoch was kind of the taboo book at that time when I was going to when I was going to school. And it wasn't really until 2022, 2023 that I started reading the book of Enoch that I started, you know, realizing, oh, it, there's, so there's a place where the uh, souls are held, right? Um, and the, uh, the spirits that, you know, crawl in their belly, they can't, they don't go to hell because that's not where the, they were, that's not the place for them to go or, or the place of holding, whatever that is. Um, but they're, you know, destined to crawl on earth. That's where their domain is. And then uh, Christopher, who's um, extremely fascinated with NDE exp uh, experiences, when he started talking about the commonalities, that's when, like you, I started, you know, realizing, you know, maybe there's something to this. Because why would there be so many people who would, who would completely unrelated and completely removed from these experiences, you know, have similar experiences like people who have no experience with christian you know with what's written in the bible experiencing these you know things in heaven and then coming back with this knowledge so um i'm starting to warm up to the idea that there's probably more that's available to know um about these kind of things so i'm not as fascinated yeah, I'll, by, I'll the, by the hell ones as christopher is christopher really likes the ones uh, that are with uh, the the place of burning. That's his. That's his passion lately is learning about those. So, uh, but mine is still just warm enough to the idea that okay, so um, we don't go to. So it's not sleep, right? So when we when we pass, uh, when we die, it may not necessarily be sleep. We may actually go to a place, you know, Abraham's bosom or something. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what Paul said when he when he said uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Yeah, that. You See, know, my that, my argument was always, well, if 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 we're present with the Lord, what's the point of the rapture? What's the point of being gathered together and changed? But you can well, you that's can a make good, no, that, that's a good point. It's a it's yeah, yeah. this is this is the intermediate heaven. So yeah. even though I call it heaven, and I you know I, I sometimes struggle because n not every near death experience is actually an experience of heaven proper if you want to call heaven like the city of God, right. the, the paradise, you know, and the, and the city of God. Um, and, and in the new book, even in, at some point, you know, Jesus is telling this one guy, you, you're not in heaven yet. We came out to meet you. Right. You can go on with us to heaven or you can go back. So it gives him a choice in that case. But I think mm -hmm. that is the intermediate heaven. And after the rapture and, you know, history as we know it, then there is a new heaven and a new earth. It's, it's made one. In other words, the dimensions are, are now seamless instead of separated, I guess. Right. Yeah, yeah. Whatever was lost during the fall is, is repaired. Yeah. yeah, and I, I, you know, I, I've thought about this, but I don't know. But it seems like it's going to be renewed, but also kind of recreated. Because even if you look at the, even if you look at the size of the New Jerusalem, if literally it's going to be on the earth, it's like too big. 
right. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's going to be unstable. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, we we just did an episode on what do you think are what do you think the new bodies are going to be like? Uh, really fascinating conversation. So there's things that we know um, that you know because Jesus obviously when he was resurrected he was they didn't recognize him and and until a certain point, uh, mm -hmm. but he you know he walked through walls and he was in more more than one location at a time. Uh, he so it's fish. it's interesting. Yeah, he and he ate tough. fish and honey. And yeah, so it's fish. like we know it's a body, and we still digest food. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. There's a lot from NDEs about about the new spiritual body, and um, and there's a lot of mystery. You know, I mean, the, the more I study, I keep putting parts and pieces together. My latest theory, um, and and. I'm not going to the mat on this. This is just, you know, John sure. <laughs> thinking late at night. Um, yeah. Is that our, our body is energy, mm -hmm. but we can take, we can take form and, and that can, we can present ourselves in different forms if we want. And the reason I say that is because, you know, like Don Piper, this one pastor who goes, He's coming up to the gates of heaven and here come his family members and his grandfather, you know, comes out and says, Donnie, you know, just like he did. And he still, he looks like he did when he, you know, when, when Donnie remembers him fondly as a, as a grandfather, grandfather right. age. But then again, people meet their grandparents and they're more like 30. They're more like in their prime. And so, which is it? And so my theory is that we can appear to one another as the other would feel more, most comfortable with in that moment. But, but yeah. I have had many people say that the inhabitants of heaven are, are typically around 30. Yeah. Fascinating. Which is kind of wild. It is. But the body is still, you know, we hug but the hugs are, they're deeper than anything we've ever experienced on this, on this mm. earth. Yeah. Um, there's a unity and a oneness that people talk about, which is what Jesus prayed for, right? That we would experience more of it now. That was his last right. prayer, that we would be one as he and the Father are one. Um, but there, there is separateness, so it's not just, you know, a melding into each other. Um, but, but there's a separateness, but there's also a unity. Um, we still have our memories. So we remember all our jokes and still have our humor and we remember our past, you know, histories and, um, yeah. So it really is life. There's, there's play, mm. there's play, there's enjoyment. You know, that, that's the thing I like to tell people is like, we, we tend to think that heaven is going to be less than this, but every good gift, every good pleasure, everything you've ever loved about earth came from God. Absolutely. Oh, sure. I yeah. mean, we can, we can abuse his good <laughs> gifts, of course, but it's still, we only enjoy it because he created us that way. So why yeah. would we think the place that is not broken and marred and, you know, stained by sin is going to be less than this. It's not. Absolutely. It's a good point. Yeah. And personally, I, like I can't it. wait to feel like a teenager again. <laughs> I love that idea of, I love that idea of having more than just five senses because I often think of the scripture that talks about the harvest to where it's like, and you know, and also the parables of like planting seeds to where it's like, we're, we're seeds right now. You know, we've got a hard shell and limited capability, but when that fruit, is fully bloomed. What's it going to be like? Like, and oh, I love yeah. that idea of like, uh, you know, it's almost like a metamorphosis, you know, to where it's just like, you know, before we, uh, you know, a, a caterpillar, all it can do is crawl on the ground, but after it turns into a butterfly, it's beautiful and it can fly. It's just like, what are, what are we going to be like? What's, what our capability is going to be like when we fully come to harvest, when we fully bloom? You know, before you said that, I was, I was thinking the same thing, that I think God put the caterpillar metamorphosis into a butterfly as a, as a sign to us. Yeah. 
I, I have seen NDEs where they were able in in the heavenly realm they were able to literally leap over rivers um you know hmm. we jump do- 40 to 50 feet or be able to run almost at uh, Mach 1 speed and stuff like that well That'd i mean cool. you can you can fly but it's it's real it's floating but it's right. also movement and there's right. movement at at the speed of thought Right. Which is a fascinating thing for an engineer to think about because, <laughs> yeah. because if you can, if you can be somewhere at the speed of thought, then what's distance? Right. Exactly. <laughs> and so it gets very interesting, right? It is. It kind of makes you wonder if we, if we don't fully understand quantum entanglement to where, can you imagine if the quantum entanglement wasn't limited to two, um, I don't know, molecules in separate locations, but they could be anywhere, in, yeah. any, anywhere at any time. So, like, how does this relate? I'm always trying to associate, you know, spiritual stuff with physical stuff because yeah. I fully believe that everything that the creator did, creator did is an example of uh, something for us to learn from because, you know, we're children now. It's like these are the things that we're learning how to read and write, but on oh, a, yeah. you know, fully spiritual level. Uh, to where it's just like, you know, this is literally preparing us for eternity. So it's like everything around us, every scenario, every situation is teaching us and molding us into who we're going to be for the rest of eternity. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm fascinated by that stuff, too, and astrophysics and, you know, thinking yeah. about, like, like I've, I even postulate in, in one of the books that are these, are these tunnels like wormholes, you know? Yeah, yeah. right. Is that what they're, what, and, and it's interesting because I, th- they are a mode of transport. Yeah. Because, they, because from the other side, in the ear, see tunnels open up and a person come in and the tunnel closes and goes away. Yeah. The, the huh. common thing that I see often is when they go to the hot place, they are falling for an extended period of time. And the more they fall, the more their hope and joy is stripped of them and the hotter it gets. And by the time they land where they're going, um, all hope is totally torn away. All, all movement of free will is stripped of them. And likewise, when that when Jesus appears to take them out of there, it comes from over top of them. That light opens up and reaches down and brings them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and likewise, when people go to the heavenly place, they ascend upwards through a tunnel as well. So your point well, is, and you know, so so here's another one that uh, I don't I don't often go public on because again, it's just this. It's just my my noodling, right? right? So I've not written this anywhere, and it's just a theory. But I have heard so many near death experiencers that were hellish of how they were dropping, yes, and almost like they they just drop through their bed, and then they start and like at first see even layers of the earth going by, yes, in this darkness mm. darker than being buried, right. And, and, and here's, and so here's my aha, maybe I always thought, okay, hell is this outer darkness and hell is this fire. You can't have both. If you have fire, it's not dark. Right. right. So I thought it was metaphor for no, a long, long time, but what if, okay, what if, the, the, the place of hell that spirits are consigned to is literally the earth. Well, yeah, that, like, that is my like understanding. In the earth, because, because in the earth it would be dark and there would be fire at the center. Well, that's my understanding of it, is uh, that's what my gut feeling or discernment says is because they drop but not only that the reason why it is so dark is because god is light and as you get closer to hell there the presence of god is less and less so they get down there and you're right there is you know flame and fire that can be seen but again god is light so you only have that very 
narrow illumination of what the fire exposes, the rest of what would normally expose the rest of, let's say, a cavern is, is not viewable. It, you don't see it because, again, God is light, hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah. And again, I'm not, uh, I'm not going on record with that. That's just my... Uh... <laughs> No, I, but you know, I, I have, I've, I've heard enough of them now to, that's made me start scratching. Like I took it off the shelf of like, yeah, I don't know about that too. Hmm. Quite well, a few kind of makes that. sense. Well, they, I've seen so many of them that experience it just like that. I mean, I've lost count where they are uh, descending and yeah. there has been many, many that says, I didn't know this for sure, but. I knew that I was in the center of the earth and there was now, so see, I many heard that. Wh wh who, who said that? Cause I'd be curious about that. Um, I'll email you a few of the email links. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Though what made sense to me is on more than one occasion, they describe the light as far as the fire, but the reason there was no illumination is because God is light. And hmm. when you're there, there is completely void of, of everything related to God. So your hope, your ability to sleep and rest, because God provides you the ability to sleep and rest. Everything there is void of God. And so many people take for granted what God does for us so much. He, mm -hmm. The reason you're able to relax and sleep at night is because that is a gift from God. Yeah, there's there's just so many things that people yep. take for granted. You know, what's fascinating is three of my pastor friends had hellish near death experiences and came back and became pastors. Just like I bet telling people. Yeah. Oh, I bet it's it's I have never experienced one and just have studying these for about three years now. They it, it borderline PTSD just from studying them. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We have a couple well, of questions the, from our, from, from our viewers, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, do you ever see any, have you talked to anybody who's seen pets during their NDEs? Yeah. 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 Many. Yeah. 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 In, in the new book in imagine the God of heaven, there, there are multiple ones who talk about and, seeing their pets and they talk. No, I have not heard that. I, I have heard that. Just like that you communicate with, just say you're standing there with Jesus, and there's that um, huh. tell, that communication. One of them that I saw on Deep Believer, their, their puppy that they had lost because it, he was hit by a car came up and was so happy to see him, but then spoke not like mouth you know speaking but it, it, it totally Spots. uh yeah it, it, it was just awesome i, so, I, I so believe so there's an to, apocryphal book go ahead oh i was just gonna say so so see that's a good example of like i was looking for that because i thought that's how it would be but i didn't find that so that would be a one-off for me from what i've heard what uh, I, i'll send it I've to heard. you yeah because what I've heard more is that they understand you perfectly. And, and, and even like this fascinating, this one uh, near-death experience from the 1890s. So 100, you know, 120 years ago. Um, and she even said she was hoping that her pet could have communicated to her, hmm. but she realized understood her perfectly. Hmm. And, and, and then, you know, others did not, did not say that they, you know, could communicate the same way. Hmm. And, and I made note of that because I was like, oh, okay, well, of all the crazy things I've heard, I would have thought that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, right. <laughs> but send me that one. I'd be curious. I, I will. I, I, I'll send you, I have a, I have a list because there are some ones that mentally or the discernment says, I think they're maybe fabricating some of their story or stuff yeah. that just doesn't line up. Well, um, and I'll tell you, you know, it, one of the things that worries me, honestly, is that the more these are popularized, 
Right. The more people are, you know, putting up YouTube channels and getting millions of views and, you know, all that, well, then the more you've got the evil one convincing people to, you know, twist this or that or make stuff up or, and, and so I don't encourage anybody to get their view of, of heaven or eternity or God or hell from one or two near death experiences. Agreed. You know, look at the scriptures and then these, I believe are God's testimony to our global world. You know, when, yeah. when else, except the last few years. And that, that's why I'm doing this because I believe that God is raising up these testimonies all over the world. Absolutely. As evil raises, you know, as evil increases, yep. God's increasing his testimony. You know, you think about evil increases during the, the World War II. Hitler wants to take over the world and is trying to wipe out the Jewish nation, right? And at the same time, you have, we find the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 66 prophecies that I will regather the Jewish people from the four quarters of the earth a second time as a sign to all the nations. It happens. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can a nation be born overnight? The answer is no. This is, this is the question God asked of Isaiah in Isaiah 66. And yet it happened. 1948. And God, and God said it's going to be as a sign to all the nations. So evil increases. God increases the testimony of his reality. Well and said. I think right now, as we're seeing evil increase, I think these near-death experiences are God's testimony all around the world. I am real. Yeah. I'm real, and that I'm giving sense. you evidence again. You know, but but you know, you're always going to have counterfeit because Satan's a counterfeit. Discernment is key. Yeah, yeah. John, it was have so you good having you. Oh, well, we have you one. Know? I have Sorry, one more Russell. question for you, or. Um, Somebody had asked, have you noticed any similarities with visions and NDEs? Anything where somebody didn't necessarily die, but they had visions similar to um, experiences with NDEs? Uh, yes. And, you know, I, I limit my writing and my study to NDEs. And, and the reason is, is because it's pretty tough to physically die and come back <laughs> and make that up. Right. right. I mean, I, I like to tell people when they say, well, why couldn't that happen to me? I'm like, well, I always see a, a scar right here because they usually get a tracheotomy. You probably don't want to have to go through what they had to go through to come back. No. Right. And so that that kind of limits the the falsifications. <laughs> um, right. Good point. But but yes, um, I've had a lot of people come to me saying, you know, I didn't die but I did have a vision of heaven and here's what it was like. And I mean, a lot of the same commonalities hmm. and I don't know what to do with that. I mean, yeah, they're, they're, there in the Bible, right? I mean, Isaiah and dreams Ezekiel and visions and, and yeah, Daniel and John. So yeah. you're right. It's just, it's a data point. Yeah. Cool. Wow. Wow. What a night. I really enjoyed having you, John. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. It was fun. Yeah. yeah thanks it's, for coming. Um, you know, uh, another time, if you're up to it, we can we can talk more. I could talk about this all night. So I, sure. maybe the audience will probably uh, get tired of me talking about this. But this is something <laughs> that, that fascinates me deeply. Well, maybe we can Not take more of, their, more of their questions if they want to shoot questions. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'll send All you right. an email to some links. I would love to get my hands on um, your books as well, and we can I can sure. share to the audience how they can get those books as well. Yeah, um, I'll send them I, to you. I think that it's great that you've put in writing uh, the correlation between Scripture and these experiences because that is such a key component for understanding um, the NDEs because so many people are hesitant because of several different things. Just like yeah. you said, your personality and watchful has a very similar personality because he's an engineer as well. Some folks just have to have that data and proof. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. and the thing, the thing that's cool about it, though, when you read it, is I tried to write it not just for engineers like me, but to really take you into the experience. It reads more like science fiction, honestly. Because, oh, fun. because you're reading these people's stories woven through this story of what's to come and, and what God is like. And hmm. so it's really, it's really kind of like, um, I mean, I loved writing it because it, it's just, I get to immerse myself in these stories and then just imagine the, you know, help people imagine what it, what it's really going to be like. And that's, that was my motivation for it. Was Have you made that? Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just saying that, that skeptics, non-believers like I was, would come to faith, but also that believers would just see how awesome the life that God has in store for us, you know, and he tells us, you know, to live for that life, not yeah. just for this life. And, yeah. but if we can't imagine it, we won't. And so yeah. that's what I hope people get from it. Have That's you great. made a an audible version or an audio version yet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. Your, uh, your books to... come up. Yeah. Just Google John Burke and we'll put a couple of links in the description and then uh, also on the community. Pretty easy to find. Very reasonably yeah. priced too. Imagine awesome. heaven and imagine the God of heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, John. Okay. It was, it was a pleasure. All right. Great hanging out with you guys. Thanks. All right, John. Have a good night. Take care. All right. Shalom. Thanks for watching the segment from our live show. We're live every night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, except for the Sabbath. See you tomorrow.